Now you have to click the continue button. Okay. <laughs> so. Oh, last time we met, we talked about the two kinds of thoughts, and that was quite helpful for people because some people, all of us, to some degree, have to meet and learn to handle thoughts. I was going to say struggle with thoughts, but that's not a particularly wise way of dealing with them. So we have to learn to meet them and know how to work with them and sometimes incline away from certain thoughts and cultivate other thoughts that are more wholesome and supportive. And so that was very uh, practical and also I think quite helpful because we read that the Buddha himself did encounter difficult thoughts, even thoughts of harming, thoughts of ill will, thoughts of sensuality in the last life of his before he became fully awakened. So it's not something that was so far removed from his experience. He actually understood it very well and had this incredibly wise insight into the two kinds of thought. So on the one hand, he said he recognized that there are thoughts that do lead to Nibbana, that lead away from difficulties, that lead basically in the right direction. And there were thoughts that led away from Nibbana that caused difficulties and obstructions. And I'm just paraphrasing now, I'm not reading from the book. So, but you can check that out. It's Majjhima 1, 9, so Majjhima Nikaya 19, and it's called Veda Vitaka Sutta, or the two kinds of thought. And so this happened to him in his meditation. This wasn't during everyday life. This was even after he'd established mindfulness and become diligent, ardent, and resolute. But he just saw these things very clearly that, you know, some kinds of thoughts lead to wisdom, lead to nibbana, and other kinds don't. And just seeing that was enough in many cases, understanding that with wisdom was enough to dispel those thoughts, to abandon those thoughts. So today we're moving on to a sutta, which is an excerpt from Majjhima Nikaya number, no, number eight, sorry. And this particular part is about effacement. And this is the last sutta in this particular chapter that is about um, general training. After that, we're moving into the subject of loving kindness. So I think if we can get through this sutta today, we'll be doing really well because there's probably a lot that can be said about this and related to in our lives. And then the next two sessions will most likely be around loving kindness and how we can use that in our practice. So as I always say, it's a really important tool, not only to learn how to relate to things wisely, not only to have a sort of meditation that is very conducive to happiness and uh, you know, cultivation of samadhi, but also as a wisdom practice. So we'll be getting on to that. But this week, we could see it as an almost as an extension of sila, of practicing uh, virtue in various ways. And it also goes into dealing with hindrances and other kinds of qualities that would be good to abandon as opposed to practice. And so we'll go through it. And um, at any time during these uh, readings, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, I will attempt also to pause at certain places that seem pertinent and invite questions. But even before then, if you have anything that you want to interject with or comment on, uh, please do so because these classes are really for us to, let's call them discussions, really for you to um, learn to dig a bit deeper and apply these things to your life. So before coming in, I had to look up the word effacement and I'm not sure how many people here are native speakers and non-native speakers, but um, it's probably not a word we say very often, we use very often. And I found out that it's actually a word used in, um, in the medical uh, field as well. So sometimes it's uh, used to refer to the thinning of skin, um, things kind of uh, becoming thin, becoming more um, see-through if you like, transparent. But in terms of conduct, the things that I would say relate to us here are meaning so Somebody's muted me. Was I only muted for a second, hopefully? Yeah. So meanings such as being inconspicuous, 
um, not drawing attention to oneself, not making oneself noticeable. Um, it can be related to humility. It could be related to rubbing out or wiping out certain defilements, certain unwholesome qualities, or even causing something to fade and disappear, which is really interesting because, of course, we want these unwholesome things to fade and disappear and to start inclining to the wholesome. But you could also take that deeper and say that we actually ourselves start to fade and disappear, especially the sense of self and that part of the self perhaps that wants to be conspicuous and, you know, be noticed, be distinct, um, that starts to fade away. So these practices, I would say, lead to a kind of humility, lead to a um, movement away from causing trouble and difficulty for others. You know, we're not conspicuous in our behavior. It doesn't cause a stir. It doesn't cause a disturbance to other people. And so this sutta is not giving us a lot of advice on how to do these things, but it's more like resolutions that we can make within ourselves. So for those who have the book, I'm hoping you found it by now. It's on page 40. And if you don't have the book, no worries at all. I'll just read it out and, uh, and see how it lands. So when I'm reading these suttas also, see how it lands with you, like not only intellectually, but in your body in your heart. Sometimes we can sense into our bodies as we listen to the Dhamma and it, certain things may cause um, associations perhaps with things that have happened during your day or month or week. Um, sometimes it may rouse a sense of urgency perhaps or maybe also a resolution within yourself, you know, a determination to move away from a particular way of being um, to another that causes less harm. So the blessed one said, now Chunda, here effacement should be practiced by you. And Chunda was one of his bhikkhu disciples, I think, but there was also a householder called uh, Chunda. So I'm, I actually haven't read the sutta recently, so I'm not sure which person he's speaking to. If anybody knows, you're welcome to pop it in the chat. But um, in either way, it is one of the Buddha's disciples that he's speaking to here. Others will inflict harm. We shall not inflict harm here. Effacement should be practiced thus. Others will destroy life. We shall abstain from the destruction of life here. Effacement should be practiced thus. So I'm already pausing because I find it quite interesting that it says, others will inflict harm, we shall not inflict harm here. Why here? Does that mean in general? Or does that mean especially when others are inflicting harm? You know, when you're actually seeing others inflicting harm and you determine not to follow the crowd, you know, to actually go in a different way, to lead by example, to show a different possibility of behavior. You could see that in terms of, for example, the peaceful protests, which I hope are still peaceful in Myanmar. You know, others are inflicting harm all around and many of the protesters are determined not to retaliate with weapons and, you know, create more harm to inflict more violence even upon those who are harming them. So it could be seen as, you know, a determination even in the face of such harm. But uh, also, in a way, I think sometimes we can learn a lot from people who don't behave wisely. It's not only, we spoke a lot in Ajahn Pramali's retreat about spiritual friendship and being around the wise and how that can rub off on us. But also, I think, although we don't want to purposely put ourselves in harm's way, we can also learn how not to be from the things maybe that we read about in the news. Sometimes it can be depressing, but maybe there's an opportunity to... Um, you know, to actually make a determination to go a different way, not to do that, and to maybe look at the root causes for harm, greed, hatred, delusion, right? It's always those root three defilements and determined to do something about those defilements within ourselves so that we, we're not able to inflict harm or to destroy the life of other living beings. So I'll continue reading, but it'd be interesting also to see if anyone else has... Um, 
ways of reading this or analyzing this that may be different. Others will take what is not given. We shall abstain from taking what is not given here. Effacement should be practiced thus. So this is the precepts, isn't it? Others will be uncelibate. We shall be celibate here. Effacement should be practiced thus. Others will speak falsehood. We shall abstain from false speech here. Effacement should be practiced thus. Others will speak divisively. We shall abstain from divisive speech here. Effacement should be practiced thus. Others will speak harshly. We will abstain from harsh speech here. Effacement should be practiced thus. Others will indulge in idle chatter. We shall abstain from idle chatter here. Effacement should be practiced thus. So that ends the basic precepts, but you'll notice that in there, the alcohol is not mentioned. And that's often the case in the suttas, not that it is something that the Buddha doesn't advise against, but I think because He's focusing more on these things. These are also precepts that are easily broken if we do drink alcohol. So he mentions that in other places, but here he's focusing on the taking of life and the stealing, the way we use our sexuality. So I think someone put in the notes there that this is about, um, this was spoken to the venerable Mahachunda, which may be the case, but Shirley says that um, it was a young Brahmin who asked about the path to the union with Brahma. So that's another interesting, uh, observation. So I'm not quite sure which one of those two it was, but I find it interesting that it's talking about celibacy because of course that's a rule that usually applies to the monastics and to those who are on a maybe more direct or spiritual path. Of course it happens along the way quite naturally I think when we progress on the spiritual path. Sometimes the interest in sexuality or even you know our own sexuality starts to change and even disappear as we become more interested in the pleasures of the world of the mind. So this is really interesting that it's in here. So it suggests that he's speaking to somebody who's you know, already practicing the spiritual path and wants to take it further. Also, um, Darren's saying that with the reference to here, is this referring to reacting in a skillful and wholesome way in that particular situation, thus leading by example? not fighting fire with fire. And that's what I was thinking too, that that could be why the word here is mentioned because you know, it might be easy enough to do that when you're not directly around those things, but when you're around other people who are actually doing the wrong thing, can we still follow the right course even amongst the presence of others doing wrong? And in that way, it sometimes takes a lot of courage, but certainly it will cause those people involved in harm to think twice, hopefully, or at least to show them there's another way. So I do think that might be part of it. Yeah. Anybody else have any comments so far on this kind of uh, way of speaking or explaining these points? Any other thoughts? Nothing much. One thing that I find interesting is that um, He's not saying others will do this, aren't they terrible? That's so bad, you know, I should get away from them. It's almost like accepting the reality that there will be people who do these things and including ourselves, right? I mean, from time to time, we also will speak harshly, divisively, indulge in idle chatter, wasting people's time, wasting our own time, you know, not using our speech in particularly constructive ways. And that's just to be expected, it's par for the course. So this will happen. But rather than kind of think, oh, you know, we need to change the world, we need to change others, we can just decide for ourselves, we won't do that. And that is also very powerful because we do have some influence over our own behavior. We don't have so much influence over the behavior of others, right? And sometimes it's the most powerful way to bring people to the Dhamma as well. I know that in the beginning, you know, the practice, we're very enthusiastic and we want to start sort of, you know, advising. <laughs> Maybe even it comes across as preaching a little bit to others, you know, about how they should start behaving. But um, 
I think it's much, much more powerful to just start behaving in ways that are aligned to the Dhamma and let people slowly, gradually realize, oh yeah, this person is changing. There's something different here. I don't hear them speaking nastily or you know, uncharitably about others. Um, I feel safe around them. Why is that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, they do speak gently. They do speak considerately, you know? Sometimes they just start to notice these things. Whereas if we tried to point them out and say, you should be this way or that way, or look, you know, I'm doing it differently now. It can sometimes come across as quite um, off-putting, I think, you know, the sense of self can get involved. And this is all about effacement. It's all about becoming inconspicuous, humble, fading away causing our own bad behavior to fade and disappear, right? Not standing out from the crowd, if you like, not following the crowd. So I think it's, it's, quite, it's actually much deeper than it first appears. So Derek's added a comment here with the reference to here, is this referring to reacting? Oh, sorry, that's the one that I already read. And Derek's comment is that the Pali word translated as here is eta. The Pali dictionary says here, there, in this, in these, in regard to this or these, in this respect, in this case, in that case, in these circumstances. So that's interesting because in these circumstances would probably relate to, you know, being in the midst of those circumstances here, there, in regard to this or these, might not necessarily imply that. But I do think it takes a certain kind of resolve and has a certain kind of power when we're able to maintain our own sila, our own virtue, even when those around us don't um, maintain theirs. Hmm. So shall I continue? We're we good to keep going? So others will be covetous. We shall be uncovetous here. Effacement should be practiced thus. So you're disappearing. You're not like looking into someone's bowl and thinking, hmm, give me some of that. I want some of that. You're kind of sitting there and just accepting what you have, right? So without that covetousness, with that contentment, we do start to disappear. Our craving starts to disappear. Our greed starts to diminish. We develop contentment instead of greed. Others will have ill will. We shall be benevolent here. That's nice. So again, I think the word for benevolent is avyapada, which is sometimes translated as loving kindness. But here the opposite of ill will is being put in the positive terms of benevolence. You could also say metta, loving kindness as well. But I think that's more powerful than just saying we'll dwell without ill will because the actual benevolence is, you know, very um, transformative in its own way. Others will be of wrong view. We shall be of right view here. So now we're getting into the outfall path. <laughs> Others will be of wrong intention. We shall be of right intention here. So now it's homework time. I would like to know if anyone can tell me what those right intentions are. Can anyone share? And maybe a word about how you understand them or practice them would be really nice to hear. Ah, okay. So who would like to say what the three right intentions are? Yeah, surely. Do you not have your little um, participant's hand button? Oh, I just, it's easy just to, sorry. I'm just, oh, it's okay. Easy. We just don't always see you. And I got the wrong footnote because they've written so small. So I'm sorry, yeah. Diana. It's the next sutta uh, that's talking to the young Brahmin. Anyway, I this shared this in our women's group last night as my favorite reflection on the Dhamma because it's when Ajahn Brahm explained this, it turned, it turned my practice around after many years and it's kindness, compassion and letting go. And that was practice to myself actually, probably more than other people, but it's it very powerful. Yeah. Just practicing kindness to everything that comes up. Yeah. 
What do you think is the difference then between the kindness and the compassion? What would you say? In my recent, you know, when I'm having sort of, on the retreat, I thought I was thinking if I was having thoughts around maybe worldly thoughts, I just noticed actually that hurts a bit. It's not peaceful. So any sort of negative thought, I thought that's that's a bit painful. It's not easeful. Oh, poor you. Instead of saying, oh, bad, bad meditator, I thought, oh, you know, you've just had a, you know, you've just had a, a thought that's a bit agitating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's 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 uh, it's it's the reaction to pain whenever there's suffering. But of course, anything can be, and kindness, I think, is just opening the door of your heart to everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And but compassion is the is the is the wise response to to suffering, mm. and it's it's quite easy. I've thought, sorry, I'm wittering on rather a lot, but mm. it's how you. It's really important, even when you. It's very very easy to sort of gloss over one's little hurts or just feeling a bit grumpy or agitated one sort of thinks oh I must be kind to everybody and you're not looking at that little bit that's hurting you and it may be just quite small so that was something that sort of came upon the retreat for me is this sort of constantly sort of saying oh where am I hurting you know just let's mm -hmm. be just be kind to that mm -hmm. and then you can more more open up to Yes. to others it's and important. respond kindly yeah. in, in everyday life yeah that's a beautiful but i realize i realize that it's just very easy to bypass mm. one's own suffering because it doesn't really feel it matters right. but it does because if we don't address it then it can come out in not very skillful ways which mm. it quite often does with me i'm afraid sometimes uh, <laughs> so uh, you know i just get grumpy and tetchy and yeah, 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 and we put it out because we've actually, like you say, bypassed it. We sort of yeah. try not to acknowledge it, and then we have more likelihood that we just project it on others. Because we're, in a way, it's easier to do that. It's you know than going in and feeling it inside ourselves. And the letting go, uh, I quite like your comment on this because I I find this part more difficult. But for me, I find thinking of it as non-identification yeah, yeah absolutely it's, I think it's helpful really you think good that's good a, you think that's a good way of reflecting i, I find, find that really helpful i mean for me the letting go is more like non-owning non-ownership mm. yeah yeah having some sense that this does not belong to me because we can only hold on to things when we think they belong yeah. to yeah right? i mean and i'm talking about sort of, i'm talking about emotions and moods as well as possessions Absolutely, yes, that's what yeah, I'm yeah, also yeah, really yeah, yeah, good. Oh, well, good. Thank you. So Thank I'm not completely off track. Thank you. I'll shut up no, now. No, 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 very much on track. <laughs> yeah, that's really important. I also agree with the, um, the danger of moving too swiftly onto sort of idealised emotions like loving kindness without addressing the pain, the suffering within ourselves. And in my experience, when we do address those things with compassion, it, that's when you turn the dog poo into sweet mangoes, so to speak. If you just ignore the dog poo, ignore the dog poo, it doesn't really go away. <laughs> in fact, it might accumulate because there's more and more dog poo happening inside. But if you actually meet it with the compassion, it starts to turn into the sweetness of compassion and connection to all beings, especially beings who've gone through similar you know, like during that retreat also for me, there were times that I was feeling quite um, sad actually by, you know, being around a senior monk who's a close disciple of Ajahn Brahm and knowing that I can never have that opportunity, no matter how devoted, no matter how close I am to my teacher, I don't get to live with him and study for 24 years before I have to teach, right? I don't get those conditions whereby I can just kind of have a very, very simple, quiet life and prioritize what I really need for my spiritual practice or what I think I really need for my spiritual practice and um, it was when I actually met those feelings and was able to sort of even express them a little bit in a skillful way 
that some sort of opening was able to happen. And it was interesting because sometimes I was actually feeling quite distressed. And then after meeting it with compassion, I came to give a talk and it was like all this love was flowing up and flowing through me that I feel I could access more in a more profound way than I would have done before. It was very amazing actually how it could change fairly quickly and give me more of a sense, perhaps, perhaps it's to do with effacement. Perhaps it is. It's like you stop struggling with your emotion. You surrender to it in a, in a way and meet it kindly with compassion. And then it's quite a humbling process, quite humbling. And so the sense of self does kind of become diminished because I guess it's again tied into not holding on to these things, not owning these things, just accepting that they're there, you know. And from that place, there's more space for a different response, for the compassion, for the connection, I think, with other people. Um, and it's an authentic connection, you know. It's not just putting on a, a smile, but it's acknowledging that, yeah, we suffer, we're fragile, we all have our struggles that sometimes others don't understand. You know, and that's not just me, that's all of us here, you know, all of us. We're all in the same place in that way. Jane's asking, kindness is an action and compassion is a feeling? Question mark. I wouldn't really categorize them as two different things in that way. Um, it could be seen that way. It depends how you work with the semantics of it, but I do think that they're very closely related and I think they can both be active. I actually feel that compassion um, can be a way, way of relating, but genuine compassion, especially the compassion translated as anukampa, which is the meaning of our project, um, it has a sense of a response. Yeah, Anukampa literally means like resonating or trembling with the suffering of others. Anu is like small, small tremors. Anukampa. Now what's kampa? Anukampa. Yeah, like small tremors. So Anu is the small and the kampa is like little tremors. So like small, small. It's like a resonance. And the Buddha was said to have taught out of Anukampa for all beings. So he actually, that was what moved him to go out for 45 years and disseminate the Dhamma. It was the Anukampa. So it's almost like when compassion becomes strong enough that it moves you, it actually moves you into connecting, to acting, to, you know, wanting to do something with that compassion. And I do think that with all these qualities, they start in the mind, but when they become stronger, they start to flow over into our speech. You know, like today, somebody came around and uh, they helped me do some washing up, which hasn't happened for... <laughs> 12 months, 14 months, right? Because I've been basically completely isolated with COVID. And they said, oh, um, you know, you're praising me a lot. You're sort of expressing gratitude quite a lot. Nobody really does that. I said, oh, really? I don't really notice that I'm doing it because it's so genuine. Like I feel just so like touched that somebody's helping and it's, I know it's going to like affect the day because I had other guests coming and, you know, to, to go on a walk and, uh, and I just realized, yeah, this is what happens, you know, when there is that gratitude in your heart, it just will find a way out in your speech. And it's not necessarily to one individual for a certain reason. It's just like it's there. It has to be expressed, you know, so it moves into action. Um, you know, it moves into, for example, with gratitude, doing something for someone else, right? Because you know how it feels when you receive. So I think all of them uh, can be both an action and a feeling. And then also in an intention, like a motivation of the mind. It can actually start with a motivation before you have much of a feeling tone around it. So it can be more of like in this sort of way, it says, it's more like a determination. We shall be of right intention here. At that point, it might not be a feeling. It might be more of like, let me prime my mind in a way that directs it wisely. So let me have right intention. It's a determination you're kind of, inclining your mind or like directing your mind a certain way, like putting the compass in the right direction. And then after a while, you start to feel what that's like. You start to feel that sense of kindness actually starting to grow and flourish inside. And when that kindness becomes stronger, it starts to manifest, you know, in your whole being. 
sometimes a person doesn't even need to say anything. You just sit with someone who's very kind and you feel it. You feel it in their presence. You know, you just feel safe. You feel unchallenged, unharmed. You can relax. It's like your whole body just, just settles down. Yeah. Loving kindness could also mean universal benevolence, someone's saying. So absolutely, benevolence, loving kindness, it's all different ways of describing the same thing. Benevolence is nice because it means we don't have to feel loving or kind. It's more an attitude, it's more feeling like a benevolent way of looking at things. And that can include love, it can include kindness, it can include lots of things, right? Compassion, wishing others well, gratitude even, um, equanimity, <laughs> it can include all of that. And yeah, loving kindness, when it gets developed to any degree, tends to be universal. That tends to be its defining feature that distinguishes it from um, affectionate love or kind of, uh, yeah, more invested love that has its biases and preferences. You know, even towards the same person, sometimes we can say we love this person, but sometimes you love them less and other times you love them more. <laughs> and then, of course, there are those you don't love very much at all. So it kindness, I mean, the way that the reason they put loving and kindness together, I think, is because it's a kindness, but it's a warmth as well. But yeah, benevolence is a lovely word and it should become universal. So the Buddha said, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, and then some people stop there and say, oh, it's a mother's love. That's what it is. No, one should develop loving kindness towards all beings. So the love that a mother has to her child to all beings is loving kindness. Can you really have the same love to all beings that like you would do? You would protect their life. You would just wish them well, no matter how they behaved. <laughs> you know, if they soil themselves, you wipe it away, you know. You look after them in sickness and in health. Yeah, sometimes you see that in the nursing profession or around care workers, you know. I worked in the care work industry for a short time. And uh, some of the people I worked with were very rough and, you know, had quite foul language, F in this and F in that. And, blah, 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 blah. and it was interesting because one of Ajahn Vermali's uh, suttas, the one that he really likes and presented to us, was about people who have... Um, kind of who are impure in speech, but may have purity of bodily behavior. And I always think of these people because even though their speech was rough and they seemed quite, you know, coarse, they were just full of loving kindness for these um, people that were actually uh, in the later stages of dementia uh, in this horrible nursing home without enough staff on the ground. And they would just do anything for them. You know, they'd run into the rooms, clean them up. I mean, sometimes they were in a terrible state. And, uh, you know, even, uh, you could just see the love and they'd say, one of them was a single mother and she'd say, I could probably make more like just working on the till at the grocery store or whatever, at the supermarket, but I want to be here because I love these people. I want to care for them. You know, who else is gonna look after them? And it was very, very beautiful. I thought that was loving kindness in action. So. Someone saying, sometimes expression of feelings feels like fueling the fire. What are skillful ways to express one's own truth without justifying the causes and conditions? Yeah, well, if it's positive feelings, then it's great to fuel the fire, you know, build it up, express it, generate it, share it. But if expressing your feelings feels like fueling the fire of anger or ill will, then it's probably a good sign not to share at that time. I think a skillful way is to wait, maybe like Shirley said, address them, meet them with compassion, notice that part of you that's hurting, first of all, you know, if you can meet that part, then you don't need to ask someone else to change or, you know, or kind of immediately vent on them. You're, you're dealing with it in a tender, compassionate way within yourself. And then when that heat, that fuel, that fire starts to kind of calm, then you can see much more clearly because you're freer from the hindrance of ill will. It's a hindrance, it distorts the truth. You can never see things clearly when you're angry, right? It's a very powerful emotion. It's a very kind of 
directed emotion you've got energy there it feels true it feels right <laughs> you know but it's not a reliable perception because as long as there's ill will that is a distortion of the truth so you deal with that you wait for that to subside and then have a look at what's left you know if you feel there's genuinely an issue and that somebody's behaved in a way that is not really acceptable to you or that you have doubts about then you could approach it by simply using like non-violent communication methods. So saying something like, when you did such and such, I felt such and such. So you're not saying you did this, it's wrong, it's bad, but you're talking about it as a behavior. You're also not saying when you are so such and such, you are selfish or greedy or lazy, but speak about it as a behavior because then the person won't feel attacked. So address the behavior Talk about how you feel when that behavior happens and try to use nonviolent language, which means rather than saying I felt um, attacked, that is saying that they attacked you. You say, I you, you find an emotion that you felt. Maybe I felt uh, fear or I felt confusion. Instead of afraid or confused, that's like saying they did it to you. So I felt confusion, I felt fear. Um, and then the third step, I'm not, I'm not very experienced in this. I haven't done workshops, but I've read about it and I would love to perhaps it further. So I, it's what I remember from my mind. The third step is to make a request. Next time if this happens, blah, blah, blah. Or this is, these are my values, what I need is this. Do you think you'd be willing to offer this? And it may be an apology. It may be an apology that you be uh, that you feel you need, or an acknowledgement that they have heard you, or something like that. So I think that is quite helpful. And that doesn't actually justify causes and conditions. That's not getting into the story so much. It's looking more at how you feel. But you can't do that when um, when you're in the midst of anger because you've not separated really their behavior from your emotions. I think first you have to figure out what's happening there and learn to address it within yourself. So I hope that gives some help. Okay, any questions live that people would like to ask? You won't be recorded, your voice will be recorded though, but not your face. So Janaki has her hand raised. Oh, sorry, I meant to let Gunter do it, but. Um, I just want to ask you whether uh, what I think is correct or I mean, right or wrong. Now you asked uh, what you what we understand by samaviti. Uh -huh. So <laughs> I was I have been thinking about it all this time, and then I thought it's now samma is something like proper or correct or right, and diti is actually if you translate it as it, it would could be will, but I think the, it, it has a, a much deeper understanding than will. It's a, a perspective or it's something, I think it's a kind of understanding the reality that the uh, selflessness or about the existence that actually that uh, the existence is only a, a, a only a dream, uh, actually there isn't anything called existence. So it's like awakening from that dream, so, which leads to the status of uh, selflessness. So that's what I thought. Yeah. I don't know, I, I may be wrong, I may be right. I don't know. just want to. Yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing, yeah. I actually asked about right intention, but it's fine also to discuss a little bit about right view. Um, Samaditi, you're referring to, that's right view, the previous one here. And uh, I think, you know, until we're stream enters, then we are just trying to come to an understanding of, of right view. And it's great to keep inquiring, it's great to keep thinking and, and, and pondering upon this. And I think you're right there in the sense that it certainly is a wisdom aspect of the path. In fact, right intention and right view are both wisdom elements of the Eightfold Path. They're the two wisdom factors. And of course, at a deeper level, at least once stream entry is attained, then you know the right view that really changes things is seeing that there's no inherent existence, there's no inherent essence of a being in here. It doesn't mean that there is nothing, the Buddha said, because arising is seen, but there isn't, you can't say there's nothing. 
sorry, you can't say this nothing because a rising is seen and you can't say the something because passing away is seen but what there is is this middle way there's a process of dependent origination cause and effect and it's that process that we mistake as a self so i think this is kind of in a nutshell understanding um, right view at a deeper level but of course it's also learning about impermanence and you know uh, suffering and the way out of suffering. So the Four Noble Truths, that there is suffering, a cause of suffering. Um, there is a way to end or uproot that cause and there's a path leading to the end of that. So right view once it's developed at the level of stream entry would be having a very clear understanding of the path to the extent that you're able to walk on it now without really much guidance at all. You know, it's, it's within you. It's as if the path has been born within you and you have unshakable confidence in the path. So it, it basically strengthens every successive factor from there. And the eightfold path is constantly like that. Wherever you are, wherever you're working on that path, whichever factor you're currently strengthening will feed into all the others, you know? And we just keep on, in a sense, going round and round it and fortifying each one successively and they all feed into the next. So yeah, the eightfold path is really wonderful. And let's see if we can carry on to go through it. Just for, especially for those who may need a reminder on that. So we started with wrong view, wrong intention. And then our, the next one is others will be of wrong speech. We will be of right speech here. Samavacha, right speech. And of course, this is an outcome of that right view and right intention. If we have right view, we understand about suffering and we understand that our actions have consequences for good or for ill. And we have this beautiful motivation of loving kindness, non-harm, letting go, then it's quite natural that we'll be having right speech. So again, this is practicing at quite a deep level because we're coming, we're purifying the intention, first of all, the view and the intention. Others will be of wrong action. We shall be of right action here. Others will be of wrong livelihood. We shall be of right livelihood here. So all the different actions now as well. So as I said, the motivation becomes stronger. It feeds into your speech and becomes an action. If it just stays as a motivation, you're not doing that much good in the world. And we are relational beings. We have to live in the world. So it's really beautiful when these things start to manifest in our speech, our actions, and even our livelihoods. Yeah. Is your livelihood part of your path? Can you make it part of your path? Because then you're always practicing, not only when you get home from work. Others will be of wrong effort. We shall be of right effort here. So that's Samavayama. And of course, the samavayama, the right effort is to, um, to prevent the unwholesome states entering the mind, to dispel them if they have arisen, to maintain the wholesome states and to increase, develop, bring to fulfillment the wholesome states, which requires, of course, an understanding of what is wholesome and unwholesome for ourselves. And in a nutshell, you can say anything that leads out of suffering yeah, to peace, to disentanglement in the world, to simplicity, contentment, virtue, gratitude, all these beautiful things you can say are the product of, yeah, the right effort of cultivating the wholesome states. And wrong effort would be leading you to more suffering, right? So cultivating things that didn't ought to be cultivated in the mind, hanging on to the negativities rather than abandoning them and you know, weakening them in through skillful means. And one of the best ways to practice that right effort, I feel, is just to work on cultivating the wholesome because it's almost as though they'll push out the unwholesome qualities from the mind. If the mind is so full of loving kindness, where on earth can ill will find a place to get a foothold? It, it, it doesn't really get a chance at that time. So then next, others will be of wrong mindfulness. We shall be of right mindfulness here, sama sati. Others will be of wrong concentration, it says. But of course, we know that 
we like to use the word stillness. Or you could use sustained attention if you wish, sustained awareness perhaps. But it's something deeper than that. It's something where the mind gets very, very still, very, very absorbed into its object. So there's no separation from you and the object anymore. So others will be of wrong stillness. We shall be of right stillness here. So notice how interesting this is, that we've just gone through the Eightfold Noble Path and we've seen that there's an opposite of each factor. So it's not only that all mindfulness is good, right? There can be wrong mindfulness. There can be wrong samadhi. There can be wrong effort, wrong livelihood, obviously. But yes, there can be wrong mindfulness, wrong stillness too. So that means not all mindfulness is good. I mean, you can be very mindful while pointing a gun at somebody, right? Very mindful of burgling somebody. My friends who visited today, they told me that uh, someone in their area was burgled and the couple were out on a 20 minute walk. The burglars came in, four men, and they were out in four minutes. And they know that because the neighbors had a CCTV camera, but unfortunately it only took their legs. So they didn't get their faces on there. But uh, four minutes it took them to go through the entire house. Now they were very focused. They were very mindful. They were extremely aware that the people could come back any time. Yeah. So that took a, a very heightened awareness. But was it motivated by wholesomeness? Was it motivated by virtue? Did they know what they were doing this for? You know, or did they mistakenly think that acquiring more, you know, even at the cost of breaking their precepts would bring them some kind of happiness? So that's wrong mindfulness. Mindfulness should be co-joined with wisdom and ethics, always. And wrong stillness, which is interesting. What are you getting still? What are you taking as your object of meditation? You know, again, are you kind of getting really absorbed in something very um, unwholesome? or just useless. <laughs> you know, you can get absorbed on Facebook. I know that one. <laughs> you can get really absorbed or like trying to fiddle with things on the computer. It's not necessarily wrong because sometimes you're going on there to serve, but it's not going to take you into like jhana states that are based on anything particularly helpful for your meditation, right? And I think another kind of wrong samadhi can be when we use willpower and force. You know, we can force our mind into deep meditation because we want to attain something. We want to boost our sense of self. And I've met people that have done that, even people. There's a man who um, was fairly well known. I mean, nobody knows him, but, you know, it, he was known for kind of boasting that he could get into first jhana and he'd tell everybody, I get into first jhana. And he was actually an alcoholic. And I knew his girlfriend at the time who he was abusing. He was actually abusing her. And this guy was somehow forcing his mind into samadhi states. Now, I don't think that's right samadhi because how can it lead to wisdom if it's not based on ethics and virtue? Hmm. Janaki says that's the difference between intelligence and wisdom, I suppose, which is true as well. You can be very clever, but not know where your real benefit lies. I remember when I was young, about 15 or 16, and I was a bit fed up because I felt like I was good at school and I was considered clever and always expected to get A grades and all this. And I just started thinking, so what? You know, what does it matter if you get good grades? That's not really um, wisdom. Like, what is really wisdom? What is really intelligence? It can't be just knowing stuff or remembering stuff. And I remember thinking about it quite deeply and, and deciding it was real intelligence or real wisdom was learning to use perception in a way that led to happiness. <laughs> and when I look back on that, I'm like, wow, that's actually what the Buddha said. <laughs> of course, I didn't know that at the time, but I thought surely the whole point of it is to be able to like regard life, to use your mind in ways that leads you in a positive direction. Because if it's not leading to happiness, what's the point exactly? Of course, at that time, I didn't really know how to define happiness. I think I felt it was somewhere, there was some link between happiness and meaning in life. And I really didn't know what that was at that time. But I somehow felt it was more about the way we use our mind, why we use our mind the way we do, than just getting kind of grades at school, you know. So yeah, I'm not so impressed by intelligence. And Ajahn Brahm, I mean, he went to Cambridge, he got a first class degree in theoretical physics and he was hanging around some of the Nobel Prize winners, you know, in Cambridge, like really famous scientists. 
And he said it was shocking to him because he'd sit at these big dinners and just a scruffy young student and, uh, and they wouldn't have really social intelligence, emotional intelligence. They didn't really have their lives together. In fact, they seemed quite miserable and uneasy around others and, and yeah, just not very inspiring. And he realized at that point, you know, there's a difference there. There's a difference there. So, I mean, even though he had this high degree and an MA, I think came along with it at that time. Um, yeah, I guess he could have gone further into academia or into the science field, but he just took a simple job as a school teacher teaching maths. Um, and he really made a difference in some of those kids' lives. You know, some of them remember him. One of them came back to him actually years later and said that they were there when he took them to, I think a monastery took them to somewhere and he also taught meditation in assemblies in the morning. And they said that changed their life. They still remember. Huh. So anyone teaching Buddhism in schools should be <laughs> take joy in that because you just never know how that might change and transform. And I mean, actually set somebody's life on the right track from the start. So it's really incredible. We all wish we'd come to the Buddhist teachings earlier, even if we came to them as teens. <laughs> So, yeah, so we've gone through the Eightfold Path now, the precepts, uh, and now we're going to two more factors, which are sometimes found as part of the Tenfold Path. So this is sometimes added on to the Eightfold Path. <laughs> and this is, in a way, you could say the outcome of practicing that Eightfold Path. So this is what happens again when you do practice all the way into deep Samadhi, the jhana states. Sometimes people say, well, what then? Where's the wisdom factor? Well, here it is. So others will be of wrong knowledge. We shall be of right knowledge here. Samanyana, I think, or sama, I think it's samanyana, or it has a compound, I forget. Yeah, samanyana, hmm, I forget. And then the next one is, others will be of wrong liberation. We shall be of right liberation here. Samavimutti, I think. So right liberation. So you get abhinya, you get knowledge, you get wisdom. And as a result, liberation. Right liberation based on the Eightfold Path. And the Buddha says somewhere else, you know, whatever, wherever people practice the Eightfold Path, there you find enlightened beings. So it doesn't matter whether you've followed that Eightfold Path as a Buddhist, a Hindu, a Christian, a Muslim, an agnostic, an atheist, a humanist, a anythingist. If you've practiced that Eightfold Path, it will lead to right knowledge and right liberation. But it starts with right view. So not everybody's view will be aligned with the Buddha's insights which is why some people get into deep meditation, but then they feel that that's union with God. So, I mean, maybe it is. <laughs> I mean, in some sense you could say it is, but according to Buddhism, that's not the end of the path, right? We can go to different realms in our rebirth or in this life, if we wish, we can visit these places in deep meditation, but that isn't gonna take you out of samsara because there's still a sense of self. You know, union with God, it's like, okay, you dissolve yourself into the great self or into the paramatma, uh, the, uh, what do you call it, like union with God um, or ultimate consciousness or something. But that isn't actually the end of the path. So with that right view, we understand that even that is suffering. Even those states are suffering. Yeah, we understand the pervasive nature of dukkha in its entirety, parinyatam. Somebody's asked a question. What is wrong liberation? That's a very good question. It, yeah, I guess if all of these factors are wrong, then we're going to have a distorted sense of what we have attained, first of all. And I think that quite often happens, for example, with that person who used to say he had the first jhana. Well, maybe he had some kind of thing that looked like a jhana, but did it carry wisdom with it? Was it actually capable of leading to wisdom? Probably not, because it wasn't based on sila. And as a result of that, there may be a knowledge that would arise, oh, I'm enlightened, or I'm this, or I'm that. Um, I would guess that might be wrong knowledge. Or there may be an idea of knowing how you got there, thinking that I got there because I did this and this and this. And actually, that's wrong knowledge too, because you 
got there using unskillful means. So you, you, you kind of walked a path, but it wasn't the right path. So you're not, you don't really have knowledge about the true Eightfold Path. And wrong liberation, I suppose it's the same thing, you know, um, just seeing that, I mean, you, you read about people all the time, the books published by people, there's one by a certain person who actually puts on the front cover, the Arahat, you know, and it's a layman who calls himself the Arahat on the front cover of the book. And then he goes to this book and talks about certain experiences that sound quite genuine. But then he has these chapters that he puts a kind of warning sign on as if these are so controversial, only the really, really kind of rebellious, more enlightened people will understand it. And he's like, warning, Arahats still have lost. Arahats still get angry. And he actually thinks that because he first decided he's an Arahat, looked in his heart, oh, there's still lost. That means Arahats must have lost rather than looking at it from a Buddhist perspective. Okay, so the Buddha teaches that, you know, Arahat means you have no more greed, no more lost. Therefore, I'm not an Arahat. <laughs> so I think it could be something like that. Possibly it could be mistaken uh, understanding of what you've attained. Um, it could be taking smaller insights for greater insights, perhaps. Um, maybe getting stuck on those. So I don't really know because, I mean, hopefully I'm not practicing those wrong ways, hopefully. Um, but I guess it's anything that's not based on the Eightfold Path, which will always include very deep virtue, some right view, right motivation. And then the mindfulness and the stillness will come as a result of letting go. Yeah, somebody's asking. Thank you, Diana. It's Samanyana and Samavimutti. Someone's saying, could wrong liberation mean freedom from moral conventions? Yeah, maybe. I mean, as I say, if it's not based on ethics, if it's not based on right mindfulness, then of course it can't really be liberation that's worth very much. I mean, what does it matter if somebody says they're liberated, but they're not living kindly? Then who cares if they're liberated? What's the point for you also to be liberated if you still suffer, right? It doesn't make any sense. I think we have to really keep this goal as something high and lofty because that's the only way we will take it to the end. We don't want to stop for small little benefits along the way. We want to go the whole way and come out of all suffering, right? The Buddha said it's possible. So if you still have anger and lust, I'm sorry, you're still suffering. You haven't gone the full way. Right liberation could be freedom from all mental defilements towards purity of mind and wrong liberation may be the opposite, freedom from physical things. Yeah, you can really interpret it in whatever way you feel is helpful for you. I tend to think that it is, like I say, based on all these factors of the path being wrong. So you've kind of got the whole motivation wrong from the start. You've got the view wrong from the start. You know, you've got your effort wrong. And as a result, whatever you take as liberation is also not, not really liberation at all. Yeah, because, yeah, I mean, I don't know that it's wrong liberation to say freedom from physical things because that's part of the path. I mean, it's not full liberation, but it's still important. It's still important to come out of attachment towards our physical things. And even as a monastics, I mean, at first we shave our head, we change our clothes. So you could say, okay, we've let go of a certain amount. And of course it's more than that. It's actually letting it, you try to ordain. I, I challenge any of you and you'll meet a lot of obstacles on the way. So there are a lot of things we have to let go of. A lot of hurdles, a, a really strong intention, motivation, um, a kind of single point of determination, but still you're only really um, relinquishing external aspects of the sense of self, the inner aspects of the sense of self still will come up and prevent the deep meditation. They'll prevent the liberation until we can, you know, just deepen the path. Little by little, those things are worn away. And that's what effacement here means. I think, you know, that learning to allow things to fade, to disappear. It doesn't just mean physical things. It doesn't just mean mental things. It also means our sense of self. And it's scary, it's challenging. So Diana says, many spiritual paths seem to have oneness as the goal. And they believe that when we die, if we're enlightened, we return to oneness, merging with one God consciousness. That is not a Buddhist perspective though. Yeah, that comes, I think, because 
the right view is not there. The right view in terms of the Buddha's right view um, of non-self is missing. So they might be doing all the other factors completely right, um, all the way up to right samadhi, but then they interpret it wrong. They interpret it, like you say, as a, as a merging with one or God consciousness. And Ajahn Brahm often says you can understand why that would be because these jhana states are like union with God. They're like something so sublime and otherworldly. You know, you're literally going to a different realm, the Brahmaloka. Brahma means God, right? You can translate Brahma as God. And so it is a, a very different state. And I think um, those other religions you talk about, I'm not sure if you mentioned which, um, even people in Buddhism sometimes, um, and other paths, other spiritual paths, might take that as the goal. And it would be probably quite understandable because it would be more bliss than you've ever experienced and you probably would never want to leave that state. So that's not a Buddhist perspective because you're still not out of all existence. You will be reborn in those realms, the Brahma realms. So, wow, we've not even got through this and I thought there wasn't much to say. There we go. It's lovely that people are, you know, feeding back and conversing even while we speak. It's really interactive and yeah, stimulating actually for me too. Uh, so we've gone through the Eightfold Path now. Um, there's quite a bit more. What do you think? Shall we read through it? Or would you prefer to take it more slowly and uh, not try to finish this one today? I'm not sure. I, I mean, I, I could just read through it and leave it with you to ponder in the week. Shall I do that? Yeah? Yeah? A few thumbs up. Okay. So this seems to be getting into the hindrances now and lots of other ways of unskillful and skillful behavior. Others will be overcome by dullness and drowsiness. We shall be free from dullness and drowsiness here. Effacement should be practiced thus. Others will be restless. We shall not be restless here. Others will be doubters. We shall go beyond doubt here. Others will be angry, we shall not be angry here. Others will be hostile, we shall not be hostile here. Others will be denigrators, we shall not be denigrators here. Others will be insolent, we shall not be insolent here. Others will be envious, we shall not be envious here. Others will be miserly, we shall not be miserly here. Others will be fraudulent, we shall not be fraudulent here. Others will be deceitful. We shall not be deceitful here. Others will be obstinate. <laughs> we shall not be obstinate here. I can be obstinate. <laughs> Others will be arrogant. We shall not be arrogant here. Others will be difficult to admonish. We shall be easy to admonish here. That's a very nice quality, very much praised by the Buddha, especially towards the monastics. We have to be easy to admonish, otherwise we're not considered fit to train. Others will have bad friends. We shall have good friends here. Others will be heedless. We shall be heedful here. Others will be faithless. We shall be faithful here. Or let's say others may not have confidence. We shall have confidence here. Others will be shameless. We shall be shameful here. Now, I would say... <laughs> Um, others will be lacking in hiri, which is like moral shame, but you could also translate it as moral conscience. So others will have no moral conscience and we shall have moral conscience. Because we're not really encouraging being shameful, other than noticing when we've done something that isn't very virtuous, very kind and feeling a sense of remorse, but not guilt, but remorse that helps us to decide we don't want to do that again. We want to try to do better next time. So I say moral conscience is much better. We want to actually establish that and cultivate a moral conscience that becomes a kind of guardian over our behavior. Others will have no fear of wrongdoing. We shall be afraid of wrongdoing here. You could say afraid, you could say cautious of. <laughs> 
these are just my preferences for Hiri and Otapa, which I think is being translated here. Others will be of little learning. We shall be of great learning here. Others will be lazy. We shall be energetic here. Others will be unmindful. We shall be mindful here. So that's slightly different from right and wrong mindfulness. Some will be just unmindful. I'm sure we've all been unmindful many times. I actually put something on to heat through the other day and uh, started a conference call and then thought, well, I'll just do some emails now. And two hours later, I'm starting to smell a really strong burning smell. And I went downstairs and the whole place was full of smoke and the windows were running with condensation. I was like, wow. I forgot that I had something on the stove. <laughs> a week later, I'm still trying to like chip off all the burnt stuff from the pan. So yeah, that was unmindful. Not really wrong mindfulness because there wasn't any. <laughs> I suppose for there to be wrong mindfulness, you're being mindful of something, but just in the wrong way or mindful of the wrong thing. <laughs> but I totally forgot this thing. So I wasn't mindful of anything <laughs> except my, my conference call, yeah. And the smell, I was very mindful of the sudden smell, which was extremely strong. And it smelled out the whole house for pretty much the whole week. I, there's still a faint smell, but it's, it's getting better. Anyway, I don't want to freak people out because I really never do those things. It's the first time I've ever done that actually. And uh, yeah, luckily the days where I have to look after myself will be over soon with COVID and you'll all be able to come and cook for me instead. <laughs> Make sure that I don't. Leave the pan on the stove. Anyway, others will be foolish. We shall possess wisdom here. That's nice. Foolish people. Others will adhere to their own views. Ah, this is good. Hold on to them tenaciously and relinquish them with difficulty. We shall not adhere to our own views or hold on to them tenaciously, but shall relinquish them easily. Basement should be practiced thus. So even our old views are disappearing, fading away. And this is very beautiful. It's not saying that we should take on other views so easily, necessarily. But if we adhere to our own views, there's really no space for taking on anyone else's perspective, and especially not the Buddha's perspective. We already made our mind up. And the Buddha said that one should never do that. While there is as yet no discovery of the truth, we should not obstinately say, this is the right thing, everything else is wrong. This is the right view, every other view is wrong. When there is yet no discovery of truth. So keep an open mind and keep discovering that truth for yourself. Keep learning from whoever you want to, whoever you can. And as this sort of says, not only those who do it the right way, but we can also learn from those who do it unskillfully too and determined to do differently ourselves. So I hope you enjoyed that. I found that quite interesting. At first I thought, hmm, maybe it's a bit repetitive, but then we had some nice discussion there too. So I hope that was a benefit and I'm always very, very happy to hear from people. I also see that you've been supporting each other putting in little sort of references there, which is wonderful. So thank you for being part of this lovely community. And I will hand over briefly now to, um, to Kelly, who will say a few words and then we'll sit together for a minute in silence to end the session. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much, Venerable Chanda, for this evening's Sutta discussion. Uh, I would like to say a few words about Dana and the practice of generosity. Uh, today's session, like all others, is offered on a donation basis, and so any contribution that you are able to make would be very gratefully received. Uh, this provides for Venerable Chandler's material needs and helps it to spread the Dhamma and uh, also supports the development of the first Bhikkhuni Monastery in the UK. So for more information about the project and how to donate, uh, the link to the Anacampa website is in the chat box. Thank you very much. Thank you. And warm thanks to the co-hosts, Matthias, Kelly and Gunther, always a wonderful team. And there's other co-hosts here that serve on the Sunday sessions. We have a Sunday session this week. 
we don't normally have it on the last Sunday of the month, but uh, because I was on retreat with Ajahn Vermali and many people couldn't come to the Sunday one because of that, um, we have an extra one. So that's at 7.30 this Sunday, uh, BST, that's British time. And we're inviting another bikini. I asked her to lead the meditation, but she was a bit shy. So I'll do that and then <laughs> I'm gonna try and get some pertinent questions so that we can learn from her. She has a lot of experience in monastic life and I know a lot of wisdom to share. And also we'll invite your questions. So anything you'd like to ask another bhikkhuni um, who may have a different interpretation or perspective on the Dhamma to me, who may have different or similar experiences in monastic life to me, who may also be you know, in the process of working out how she wants to develop something in her own country. So please do come along and meet another voice, a monastic, a female monastic pioneer bikini in the robes in the holy life. So I hope you will enjoy it on Sunday. And also, yeah, there's only about less than a month that I'm going to be still teaching before the rains begins. I'm having an extra month this year on my rains because I've been very, very tired and overstretched. Um, I actually was hoping to do a longer retreat, a really long retreat this year, but I couldn't get to Australia for that. So instead of three, I'll do four. But I will uh, also be inviting some bikunis once a month to teach for you during that time. And we'll have a few peer led groups as well. Um, before then, I'd just like to remind people that we do have a retreat planned in December with Ajahn Brahm and myself. So it'll be similar to what we did with Ajahn Brahmali, but with Ajahn Brahm instead. So he'll do the first two sessions and I'll do the evening session and really, really encourage you actually to come along because even though it's online and many of us don't know if we're going to be preferring to go to retreat centers or on holidays or just maybe having to go back full time to work, a retreat at home can be just as rewarding as one in a retreat center. And we have some feedback from Ajahn Brahmali that from people who've been on his retreat in Derbyshire, beautiful countryside, wonderful venue. And they said this retreat was even better not necessarily because they were at home, but because the teaching is, is what really makes the retreat, I think, and the space that we create together. And perhaps for some being at home offers that sense of solitude. And um, I think it can be quite a boost to our confidence to know that we can meditate wherever we are, you know? So see if you can set something up for that, that's in um, December 6th to the 12th. So you can follow us, of course, on, uh, yeah, somebody already put the website page with the events and then the special events as well. So without further ado, I shall leave you here. Thank you to everyone who came, especially if any of you were here for the first time. And I hope that you'll join us again next week. We will be on the loving kindness theme next week. So let's make the three big sadhus, which does mean awesome. <laughs> Sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, <laughs> very good, lovely to see you all, take care, thanks for your kind comments. <laughs>